Welcome back to our conference today with our final presentation from Indo-Pacific Command. As you have seen five times now, each geographic combatant command has a different way of addressing climate change. While Indo-PACOM has been the environmental security leader and a key humanitarian assistance disaster relief expert for years, they've taken an alternative approach to incorporating climate change. The Indo-PACOM commander tasked the already well-established Center for Excellence in Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance with their new climate change impact program. The J4 and J5 representatives collaborated with the climate change impact program. And today we hear from the leader of the program himself briefing us on Indo-PACOM. And I'll leave the rest to our moderator and speaker. As a reminder, the conference program with the agenda is in the chat and you can download it from the events page. So next, I will introduce our final moderator, Dr. Hyatt Alvey in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval War College. Dr. Alvey, thank you for being our moderator for the Indo-PACOM presentation today. Commander Cameron, thank you very much and what an outstanding conference you have organized for us. Welcome and thank you. And good afternoon to everyone. My name is Hayat Alvi. I'm in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval War College. I'm very honored and happy to moderate this panel today. And we are going to hear about the Indo-PACOM Climate Change Impact Program. Before we introduce our speaker, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to provide some administrative guidance to you. Please post all questions and comments in the chat for the question and answer period after the presentation. You also have the ability to upvote questions, which will help us identify the most important questions to ask our panelists. Representing Indo-PACOM is the director of the Center for Excellence in Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance and Indo-PACOM Climate Change Impact Program. Mr. Joe Martin. Mr. Martin, we look forward to your presentation today. The floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much. So. Um, I'll leave my camera off for just a second as I do sort of some opening comments and then really want to get into the details. But um, I'm going to grade myself based on the number of participants. I've seen it as high as 215 today. It's currently at 180. If I stay somewhere around that number, then hopefully this was an effective presentation for everybody. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, this is not just a J4, J5 uh, tag team presentation, um, partly because Admiral Aquilino decided that he really wanted to stand up a separate function uh, within the command because climate change impact uh, directly relates to the propensity frequency, et cetera, of natural disasters um, here in the Pacific. That was the, a natural alignment to put it within my organization as a new line of effort uh, that was actually resourced separately from the things that we do normally. Why is this uh, such a big deal and so significant in the Pacific? Well, first, uh, as you'll, if you've ever heard of Indo-PACOM command brief, uh, the command covers 52% of the Earth's surface. We have every conceivable climate issue here. And then climate directly affects all of our plans and operations, as well as a significant number of geopolitical challenges. Additionally, on the island of Oahu itself, I'll give you a, an example. So back in August of 2018, uh, just on the in the state of Hawaii, uh, we were experiencing an active volcano, small earthquakes, wildfires, hurricane lane, flooding and landslides, uh, all on the exact same day, which makes for an exciting place to live. And sometimes the climate change aspects of this are very serious and personal to the command. So this briefing is gonna go just for a heads up, a little bit from uh, some simple science to uh, policies and practices. And I apologize for the initial simplicity of it, but if any of the slides or information you find useful to uh, yourself, you are welcome to steal, these, to steal these as you see fit. Go to the next slide, please. So sort of what you're gonna see again in the first few slides would be sort of setting the stage, uh, really some of the implications for security cooperation here in the middle with some of our challenges. And then I'm probably gonna sit for a little bit on uh, some of the government policies programs as well as what Indo-PACOM is doing in sort of the last couple of slides. So next slide, please. 
So I was able to give a similar presentation to this yesterday at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies and really trying to leverage into what are the impacts to the theater of climate change. Uh, so we're just going to run through a few of these quickly, uh, acknowledging that most of this is probably fully aware to members of this audience, but it does have an impact on others when they see some of these uh, things for the first time. Next slide. So let's just speak to, uh, there's going to be four of them really. So higher ocean temperatures and what does that lead to? Uh, scientists out there, and I am not one. I was a logistics officer in the Air Force uh, before I started doing the humanitarian business about seven years ago. Um, higher ocean temperatures lead to all the things you see there. And one of the studies, interest, one of the studies, uh, interesting points out that rising sea levels are not just caused by obviously evaporate or uh, you know melting of ice caps, et cetera. It's actually the rising of the temperature of the ocean itself. Uh, through thermal expansion causes much of that. Uh, is this real in the Pacific? Well, certainly uh, the folks at Osaka Airport back in September think it's real as you see a storm go through and the water pretty much has sort of no place to go as you're right at the uh, sea level rise there in the airport. Next slide, please. So what happened down under a few years ago as well, um, the higher air temperatures, et cetera, had led to really sort of a, a, a ridiculous uh, confluence of, of bad happenstance for them in which about 20% of our, the nation's forests actually burned. Um, higher temperatures obviously lead to ice melt, snow runoff, and clearly more extreme weather patterns in a range of different areas as air temperature often feeds uh, other storm activities. Next. As I mentioned, we kind of have it all here in the Indo-Pacific. So the picture in the middle there is a, uh, is a sandstorm a dust storm basically in Mongolia, and then the right hand side is sort of some of the permafrost melt issues of basically explosive methane uh, charges or explosive methane activities in, in different areas. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the effect that some of these have on training specifically, but clearly higher ground temperatures as well lead to certain challenges. Next slide. And as mentioned, um, you know, they, it, the, the change in ocean acidification, the change in fisheries, uh, illegal and unregulated fishing, et cetera, uh, really ocean acidification can drive the movement of fishing grounds, et cetera, from places who are very, very reliant on that to other locations that can lead to, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, some uh, security issues as well. Um, but clearly things like coral reef destruction and, and some of those fishery stress lead to, to big issues, especially when you think about the fact that there are about 10 countries in the Indo-Pacific region, I could list them all if you want me to, that are really listed economically as tuna dependent. So the movement of fisheries, et cetera, is, is a really big deal for their pretty much overall economic livelihood. Next slide. So let's talk real quickly about some of the security impacts then of climate change. Next slide. And I'm going to sit on this slide for a little bit because this really is the way that the Indo-PACOM Climate Change Impact Program uh, was started. I started working on this particular project back in July of this year, and Admiral Aquilino uh, was pretty adamant that says, I want you to look at the, the war fighting impacts of climate change. He says, there's a lot of other people uh, looking at you know, electrification and fuel efficiency and solar panels and the rest of that. He says, your mission, and he actually said this several times, is not to change the axis of the earth. It is to understand the impact of war fighting. So to do that, to be able to frame what we're doing here, uh, I use this chart and start out with sort of the scientific measurable information all the way on the left under climate facts. And I really have no interest in getting into an argument with anybody ever about are these things measurable and actual because I was a math and stat major in college and I like numbers and those things are simply measurable activities. But what is the impact? Uh, where do we see those things that sort of display themselves? And you can see a sea level rise changes, flooding, droughts, riverine desertification, uh, extreme weather temperatures, et cetera, are the ways in which those things are expressed. But none of that really matters unless there's humans there. So what are the impact on humans then of all these, these changes and these impacts to the climate? And you can see the list that we track in the middle. Most of those humans, as I would argue, sort of live in a state structure environment or a country in some form or fashion. And then those states 
are affected and sometimes their security is significantly affected by the effects of climate change. And uh, it has already mentioned the increasing need for uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief support, both internally to countries as well as providing uh, inter or external and international support. Uh, in certain places, literally climate change can, can uh, provide significant stress to already fragile governments. We'll talk a little bit about that more in the next slide and in certain places in the Pacific specifically. So think about the Maldives and Kiribati and Vanuatu and others is literally uh, the entire nation could, could go underwater. Um, so there, are, there is an existential threat to both big cities uh, as well as to nations themselves. The impact then comes to sort of Admiral Aquilino's, you know, question is, you know, well, what is the effect on me? You know, what is the effect on the warfighter and the geographic combat command? Because my mission is to provide national security uh, options and, uh, you know, resources and capabilities to the Indo-Pacific region to support the national defense strategy and, and our, our government. Uh, these four here will be expanded a little bit more on the next slide, but really it's the program today and the things that we're working on are trying to find tangible, physical things that we can do to try to mitigate or adapt to some of the risks and hazards in order to, to accommodate the impacts on the warfighter from climate change. Next slide. This slide breaks it into sort of two sides and you can see the little banners off to the left said impact on readiness the banner to the right, so the potential for conflict. Um, impact on readiness, and it was mentioned, I think, from the NORTHCOM folks, is the level of damage caused by the changes in weather patterns. The picture down at the bottom, I think, is from Tyndall Air Force Base, the and the sheer amount of damage that was caused by Hurricane Michael. Uh, think about that with respect to uh, both main operating locations in the Pacific, as well as forward operating places that we want to operate from in foreign countries. Extreme weather also obviously impacts uh, training opportunities and uh, as well as operations themselves. Uh, and one of the other options that was just discussed, and I'm trying to remember if it was Northcom or Southcom, that talked about the amount of times and the number of times that you're going to respond to a disaster. Obviously, in Northcom, it's a DISCA function. Out here, it's a foreign humanitarian assistance function. But the fact is, every time a military force deploys to provide HADR support to a disaster stricken area, uh, every day they're there is a day that they're not training. Um, certain cases, it does increase uh, specific task level training. So, for example, helicopters flying humanitarian assistance missions uh, are still learning the same basic flight skills as they would in other type missions. But, you know, if you think about the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade out of Okinawa, the more often they're responding to disasters, the less ready they're going to be to respond to disaster or to conflict uh, in other areas of the region. And then damage to training ranges themselves with respect to, to really anything. So um, if you think about the, the training facilities in uh, San Diego, for example, there's a significant amount of challenge associated with water damage and, and et cetera for the Navy SEAL training location there, uh, as well as other topics such as permafrost melting in, the, in Alaska and other places uh, reduce the ability of the Army to keep their forces trained due to that. On the right hand side, this really is sort of the other piece. There was a discussion earlier, I think about on the Intel community and their support to this and where can you get information. There really are uh, significant areas for conflict possible out there. Uh, here's just a few listed and I'll talk more about the Mekong River in a second. Uh, climate induced migration uh, is a significant issue and I'll speak to that in a very specific example from Bangladesh. And uh, if you go back and look at what's happened in Afghanistan, some of the compounding factors of that have really been a persistent uh, drought and uh, you know food insecurity issue there. And there are ways to actually weaponize climate change as well. So you know, cloud seeding, et cetera, to steal from others. And I, I think I heard within the AFRICOM presentation uh, that was talking about you know how can you access resources, et cetera, using climate change maybe as a cover story for the Russians or Chinese to get in uh, to access or harvest some of those minerals or fossil fuel. Next slide. So what does this look like uh, specifically to military readiness in the Pacific? I'll give you just a couple of quick pictures here, one military, one civilian. Uh, for those of you who've been to Hawaii, this is Marine Corps Air Station in Kaneohe Bay uh, in its current condition. Uh, if we could build this slide, please. And this is the same location at two meters of sea level rise. So unless they put pontoons onto the F-18s and the uh, you know CV-22s and other weapon systems that will fly in and out of that place, there's going to be a significant emotional event going on 
with respect to military readiness around 2050, uh, if nothing changes here out at the Marine Corps installation. Next. But not to be outdone, it's not just a military problem. Uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, that is one of the power plants that is on, on uh, Oahu here. Uh, you can see the water level, that's basically um, Pearl Harbor. So the water level there is not much. The far right-hand side is one of the other power plants, so right along the coast on the leeward side, subject to uh, water incursion damage, et cetera. And then, of course, we have the reef runway, if you've ever flown into Hawaii. Generally speaking, you're either going to take off or land from this one, depending on the winds. And uh, sea level rise there would have a significant impact on uh, that particular runway. That is a, a shared runway, if you're familiar with it, between the U.S. Uh, military forces as well as the, the commercial airport itself. So take that out and you basically reduce the capacity to move stuff in and out of the island pretty significantly. Next. All right, so let's go through just a couple of security related case studies and we'll start uh, with Fiji, which is you know one of the multitude of, of islands out there. We're gonna talk to a very specific example. So if we could build this just a little bit. Actually, you can click one more because I think there's another one down at the bottom right. Thank you much. So basically, um, you know, it's a little coastal village along uh, this particular island here and the saltwater inundation, tidal in incursion, et cetera, basically sort of took out their capacity to live there. So they decided, well, we'll just move a little bit farther inland and that should be okay. <clears throat> Fact is that didn't work out for them really well either. They actually ended up moving it to another island. So, you know, they, a small sample here of migration, uh, climate migration, but the challenge in this particular one is it's very situationally based. So in Fiji, for example, in many of the, the island states is there is no such thing as like land that you can buy. Uh, it's really communal and family land. Um, so if you're not part of that clan or et cetera, you really have no place to go and that can cause significant issues. Uh, in this case, it worked out okay, but the fact is, People had to move because of changes uh, in weather patterns in some of these island nations. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that I was gonna talk about the Mekong River. Um, next slide, we need to build that out a little bit, please. Um, so the, the Mekong is, is compounded by a couple of different problems. Um, the first is obviously damming upstream of it within China, uh, Lao, uh, Cambodia and Thailand, as far as restricting the water coming down, sea level rise, as well as saltwater inundation are moving uh, water and risk levels up. And you can see the bottom right hand picture. At a certain point, once saltwater gets into farmland, it becomes unusable for a very extended period of time. So the question from a security perspective is, hey, that's bad, but why does it matter? Well, it matters because within this region, you can see in the bottom there, about 80% of the 17 million people there rely on rice cultivation for their livelihoods. Um, well, what happens in a country like Vietnam or elsewhere, where now you've got about 14 million people who are pissed off uh, because they can no longer do what they used to do? Um, the internal strife, the potential for conflict within Vietnam itself is a very real hazard um, with respect to displaced people or with respect to disgruntled people. Uh, and then it could also have international implications and it really kind of is anyway with respect to the damming upstream in particular by Laos and then farther upstream by China and restricting water access in. I'll show you another picture of that later that talks uh, a little about the water level itself and those hazards. Next slide. Well, this is kind of a, I mentioned earlier the, the climate migration issue in, in in Fiji with about 150 people from one clan and one family having to move. Um, so if you look on the left-hand side of the slide here, you can see sort of the Delta region in Bangladesh today. So Bangladesh has got, I wanna say total, it says 112 on here, but there's actually about 165 million people that live uh, in Bangladesh. And with a 1.5 meter sea level rise, you can see on the bottom half of that picture, just how far the Bay of Bengal moves up into the land. Uh, prediction uh, it says here about 17 million people will be affected by it. That's a significant emotional event for any country, but for a country that is already uh, one of the most disaster prone, prone places in the world, uh, it can be significant because that is also where the vast majority of their food is generated. So not only do you have now 17 million population or, or climate migrants, you also have food security and water, water security issues driven by that. How bad has it been? 
Well, if you look at the picture in the upper right, that's basically a fence that the Indians built back in the early 2000s to try and restrict the uncontrolled movement of migrants uh, from Bangladesh into India. Next. So I really want to just very quickly touch on some future trends. Um, again, these are some, some slides that are used to really show patterns to folks about how and where and when things will get worse. Next slide. I'm going to sit for this one for just a second because when we look across the Indo-Pacific, it really is sort of regional-based analysis. So you can see sort of the top line there with the Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Asia, and the islands. Uh, this is from the most recent set of IPCC reports that talks about what is happening climate impact trend-wise along those, was that, eight or nine categories there. Uh, it's getting worse pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, and, and then the effect that you have and what are the outcomes of that uh, are, are down the right-hand side and that I'd already talked to uh, the number of disaster and hazard-based events that are going to occur, uh, which lead to, in many cases, both water and food, food security, food scarcity and insecurity, <laughs> excuse me, which can lead to migration, displacement, hostilities, all kinds of stuff. And then really, in certain cases where the military, where I have sort of the greatest interest from an indo paycom perspective is what would be the damage to those infrastructure and facilities that we would we would rely on uh, should a conflict break out in the region? And then interesting is this can actually, in many cases, com compound uh, pest and disease spreading. If you think about places, for example, that aren't used to getting that much moisture, uh, that means they're probably not used to having that many vector-borne disease outbreaks from from mosquitoes or other things. Uh, well, now all of a sudden, what if you bring in a higher frequency of malaria? Dengue, Zika, any of the other vector-borne viruses based on now a change in water patterns to a country that's probably already not medically that high level anyway, and now you're introducing new challenges and diseases there. So what does this look like? Um, we'll just blast through a couple of these real quick. Next slide, please. On the military side, that's one of the, uh, the military installation or facilities on Kwajalein Atoll. Um, the prediction is that about a meter, meter and a half sea level rise there is that the vast majority of that will become unusable, um, which from a military perspective is obviously a bad thing, uh, which is compounded, which is on the civilian side, look to the right. Uh, any of the purple areas that you see, pretty much if you're on an island in those locations, you're in big trouble. Uh, and you can see the percent or the, yeah, the percentage of the population uh, living in low elevation areas is sort of the pink border around most of the countries in the Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region, South Asia, Southeast Asia, et cetera. So, so within the Indo-Pacific region, the sea level rise and the challenges that it brings are pretty much prevalent to almost any country except uh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Mongolia. So I guess those guys are lucky. Everybody else is gonna have some issues with this in some form or fashion to different levels. Next slide. What does it look like from a food insecurity perspective? And just blasting through real quick, what happens if you change fishing patterns, et cetera? You can see sort of the familial arrangement for fishing uh, down in picture in Indonesia there. And then even though this, this projection goes out to 2070, uh, if you look at corn yields and projection, projections, it's pretty significant in some very highly populated areas of the world and certainly uh, across the Indo-Pacific region in many cases, uh, just that, that one commodity alone will be significantly impacted. Next. What happens to water? You can see this, uh, this is the picture I uh, alluded to earlier. The bottom right-hand side is a picture upstream in the Mekong uh, that, and shows really the, the drop in water level. Um, not only does that affect freshwater access for the folks in Thailand and other places, it also affects basically the freshwater fishing and the other irrigation purposes that they use that river for. Um, so freshwater access there is a, is a significant event. And then as you look to the left-hand side of this and you start seeing the hazards, you know, obviously red is bad. Red is, red is less, blue is more. Um, interestingly, the change in, in patterns in both directions can be catastrophic uh, based on either generating droughts or generating additional flooding, sometimes in a country in which uh, both will occur at almost exactly the same time. Next. So we're going to talk a little bit about policies and programs, and I would encourage anybody here, because we work pretty hard on it, to steal the next slide that I'm going to pull up. Because it really does kind of capture is why does the, the Department of Defense 
care so much about this? What are the things that we're doing? And, and so much of this has really taken a new life to it since the inauguration in 2021. Um, you know, that first executive order sort of drove the boat back in October this past year. Uh, many departments and agencies across the government sort of released their their climate and policy products <clears throat> prior to the the, the COP conference. Um, and you can see sort of the three key ones at the bottom that I think all of us at the GCC level specifically look at as a source for how and why are we doing these things. Obviously, the risks that we each experience is a little bit different. Um, you know, the, the things that that we are, are talking about, and I think it was Commander Cast from UCOM was talking about waiting for the NDS and the NMS to come out so that we can see the, the, the directive nature of those products into how we're gonna manage our business. Uh, the draft version of the NDS that I saw had, I think climate change was mentioned 17 times. Uh, the previous version of it, obviously under the previous administration, it wasn't mentioned at all. Um, in the case of Indo-PACOM, we then translate this. So for example, the climate change impact portion is already in our theater campaign plan. And uh, we are beginning the first, and it's in the campaign plan because we put it in as part of this project. Um, and it's being getting sort of its first level of assessment now so that my boss can take that to uh, his first basically assessment of our progress here in the Indo-Pacific to the Secretary of Defense. Next slide. Uh, so it was mentioned in the beginning that, that we were sort of set up uh, as a unique function. That is true. Uh, on the 15th of July this past year, Emma Lacalino appointed me as the director uh, as an additional line of effort within my primary responsibilities or what used to be my exclusive responsibilities on the humanitarian assistance and disaster management side. Uh, he put his money where his mouth is the next day, and I was able to hire four dedicated staff members. Uh, that gives me some unique capabilities here because I already had a pretty good, pretty robust research and training function within my own organization. Uh, and it allows us really to network across the DOD and others. So I've, I've heard mention of some of the groups up at, at, with inside the Beltway. And then uh, Andrea, it was truly a pleasure, and I appreciate you uh, inviting allowing sort of the GCC inputs to this program because it should give anybody listening a better view of, uh, of what all is going on. And I, I'm gonna think, I'm gonna, I think I got one more slide of interest here. We go next. And, and I'm gonna just go sort of run the horn on this one because this is what we're doing within the climate change program at Indo-Pacific Command. So the four circles in the middle pulled from the, the climate assessment or the climate um, risk analysis and what the DOD should be doing, uh, as well as sort of the climate adaptation plan that says, hey, these are the areas of interest. The only one that we didn't list here uh, was the uh, climate impact on, I think it was uh, logistics <clears throat> or supply chain, that's what it was. Um, partly because that's not within the design of this particular capacity. There are others in the Pacific who are working that. Um, and it's certainly very important, but going sort of on the upper left-hand side, we've established within the command several different networks internal. One is on Oahu itself. Uh, so there was a mention of the University of Hawaii and some of the great work that they do, studies, analysis, modeling, et cetera. Uh, they're actually a part of our team as well as NOAA, the Corps of Engineers, a couple of NGOs here, East West Center and others. Uh, we also established a community for Indo-Pacific Climate Security, or CIPSIS, that is basically allies and partners. Uh, we went out to each of the security cooperation offices and said, hey, we want both a military and a civilian uh, point of contact that care about climate change within your respective governments. And we're forming that group up, the intent being to, to share best practices, to maybe bring, uh, connect resources to requirements, uh, because so much of the work that can be done in this arena does not have to be done by the Department of Defense. There's only a, a certain amount of money to go around. And the more research we do, the more networking that we do, the more we understand just how many people are already in this environment. Uh, I'm fortunate in that I guess I haven't met anybody yet who cares about the climate change impact on the warfighter and on the numbered plans that are here in the Pacific as much as I do. So I'm not treading on anybody else's uh, sort of rice bowl. But we have met folks who want to adapt and, and partner in different projects. And I'll give you an example. I had a conversation the other day with the New Zealand consulate, and now they're connecting us in a bilateral fashion to New Zealand <clears throat> to try to see what the U.S. and New Zealand are doing in a shared space in the South Pacific uh, as far as assistance to some of the hazards and challenges there. 
On the information side, um, we have gone out and sort of discovered a lot of data that is out there. Um, it's pretty amazing all the stuff that, that people are already doing. And I guess there was a question uh, with respect to some of the data projections, et cetera. Uh, what I would offer is, you know, just keep digging because there is either a university or a private organization or somebody out there who's probably already done it. Uh, I say this because when I started asking about places like Palau and Guam and American Samoa and other islands, one of our partners actually said, well, let me send you the four reports that we've already done on each of those islands that tells you everything you need to know projecting out 15 years. There's also an organization, if you haven't heard of it, it's called the Pacific Disaster Center Global or PDC Global. PDC actually has a, a global mandate and does work internationally. They are a DOD funded organization out of Maui and they have a ridiculous amount of data, information and uh, analytical capability. So again, PDC Global on Maui, I would recommend that you look up their stuff. I know Southcom uses them extensively and I understand they have roots and activities in AFRICOM and UCOM as well. The bottom right hand side, I'm blessed in my current assignment uh, in that we already do a significant amount of humanitarian assistance disaster relief training here. So it has been a natural segue to add climate change pieces to that. And we're already involved in most of the Indo-PACOM exercises in trying to insert climate issues as well as other issues into that. Uh, on the infrastructure side, we are right in the middle right now of looking at a vulnerability analysis for many of the nations, many of the countries within the Indo-Pacific, working with PDC Global and others to say, hey, you know, where, where are the risks and hazards and what this, what is this going to look like? There was a question on timing, I think, that, that how far out are you looking? Uh, you know, I'm really looking at what are these locations going to look like in about, say, 2030? Um, which bases, installations, et cetera, are going to be affected by climate change in the Pacific? And what can we do from a construction perspective to try and mitigate or adapt to those things now? This includes uh, mission assurance projects, if you're associated with any of that. Um, and then also trying to work with our allies and partners on some of their own climate change issues. All right. I will hopefully go to the next slide. Yep, and this will wrap it up in one more slide, if I remember correctly. There you go. So this really does, in the Indo-Pacific specifically, you know, with 36 countries in the AOR and the things that we're looking at, and the major war plans and all the hazards and risks and disaster challenges that I've already talked about, um, you know, this really is significant to the command and its effectiveness. And uh, we are attempting within the function that we're doing here to try and get ahead of a piece of that, uh, but also really reaching back and, and we've tried to get involved as involved as possible in recess and some of the other projects like Captain Lightfoot and others are doing with, between them and Kim Cruz at OSD um, and really understanding what others are doing. So this has been, although I tell you, I only woke up at 3.30 this morning, so I didn't see the CENTCOM briefing, but uh, I thought the rest of them were excellent and I appreciate all the hard work from my uh, cohorts in crime in this uh, very important area. At that point, I think I will stop um, that seems like long enough to be talking. Thank you very much, Mr. Joe Martin, for your presentation on Indo-PACOM and the Climate Change Impact Program. We will now turn to Q&A, and there are several questions, so I'll, I will read them one by one. So the first one is, <clears throat> the current strategic plan for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, DSCA, does not address climate change at all. Is Indo-PACOM providing input on needed updates to the DSCA strategic plan? So that's a great question. I actually had a meeting uh, I think it was the day before yesterday with uh, Brigadier Litster, who is our, our uh, British officer who runs that for the Indo-Pacific Command. And, and the question I had was a little bit more tactical, which is, how do we get money to do all this? <laughs> right? You know, I want to I be able to mitigate and adapt to these things. So they looked across all the different authorities uh, that are available. So looking at 333 and 332 and, and all the different opportunities that are out there that may be unique to PACOM and others. And they really boiled it down to is, is the best way to link these projects today would probably be through the ODACA process. Um, if you want to do something, and it's probably because ODACA has a, has a pretty wide capacity to it, 
but you're correct. And, and many folks in the environmental security arena know this, is that environmental security has never been really resourced through a DACA. DIAC was sort of the only chance that it ever had to get any money. And, and I guess this year they're going to get a million and a half or so, um, which Paycom's taking all of, by the way. So don't even bother turning any packages in. We, we got it. Um, but it really is, is what authorities and things can be changed so that the effects of climate change can be addressed resource-wise. Uh, I'm not sure who all of our folks are on from, from OSD policy and the, the climate section there, but that's specific questions that we're asking to Kim and Annalise and Josh Busby saying, you know, what authorities are gonna be created and what resources will be available so that we can put our money where our mouth is with respect to addressing these climate change hazards. So, so yes, we're engaged uh, both at the OSD level and at the PACOM policy level. Thank you. Next question. Which militaries in South Asia and Southeast Asia have institutionalized climate security into their doctrines or have expressed interest in engaging on climate security issues? So sort of two part answer. So across the Indo-Pacific, the U.S. military, I'm sorry, the foreign military forces, the forces of that country, in many cases are the primary responders to disasters. Um, so from a disaster response perspective, many of the militaries are very actively involved. But I will tell you, when we ask the question to them about climate change and climate security issues, uh, it was almost, not exclusively, but certainly the preponderance of the more developed countries um, already had an interest in a program at Singapore about, you know, lost their minds. They were so happy to find somebody else who wanted to get engaged with them on this. At the Ministry of Defense level, it was nuts. Uh, New Zealand's kind of the same way. Australia is pretty much in the same boat. But when we talk to Papua New Guinea, they go, hey, look, we, we don't have this at all within our, our Ministry of Defense. We're trying to make sure that dudes have boots and guns. You know, so the answer is, like many things in Asia and probably across the globe, is it kind of depends on which country uh, you're looking at. And, and in many cases, across Oceania, for example, there's only four countries in Oceania that have militaries at all. So, so you can't. So their answer is none. Um, hopefully, hopefully that helps to answer the question. Thank you. The next one says... Can anyone give a concrete play-by-play -play example of how the Russian, Chinese, Russian and Chinese exploit uh, climate change phenomena to gain additional access? I mean, if the UCOM guys are on, I mean, everybody seems to surround Russia or at least be engaged in Russia in, in some form or fashion, even the NORTHCOM guys probably to an extent. Yes. Yeah, so so um, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit if it's okay. I, mean, I just, nice I'm still on the call here. So, um, so from the Russian side of things, they, they've gained access and they're really accessing their resources on their northern slope and then pulling those resources around to other markets. So it's opened up the northern sea route, which and, th and that's OK, because those are their resources that they're that they're engaging in. Where the challenge is with Russia is that whenever they have a resource, they feel this uh this need to go ahead and to protect that resource. And so the first thing they do is that all of a sudden there's cruise missiles up there on this Northern Sea route that's defending the Northern Sea route. And there's, and, and now they want to own the Northern Sea route and they want to, and they, they want to control all the access across that. And there's a, there's a bunch of, uh, of, uh, um, requirements they put in place so that other ships can't use the Northern Sea route. Um, and so it would just be Russian and Chinese ships effectively or, or ships that are just servicing Russia that would use that route. So that's how they control the access. And that gives them at the same time, because of climate change, there's increased access to our Northern Sea areas also. Um, and, and interestingly is that what we're seeing with climate change also is that fish stocks are moving further north also. So now there's crabs up off the North Atlantic that were never there before. So we're seeing protein sources. The Chinese are well aware of this on the on the, uh, the Pacific side, and they've been in there mapping um, what's going on as far as those biological growth in that area. And you can anticipate that we talk about those those hundred vessels that are out there, thousands of them that are out there, fishing vessels, that we're going to see that off the northern coast of Alaska as it goes around to the Arctic area when that area does open up, because the stocks are going to move into those areas. It's going to be very fertile ground. It's going to be very ripe for, for that type of fishing in the future. So we see that there's before 
the ice and everything, it prevented ships from going into those areas for a vast part of the season. Now that access is open and there's there will be a av- new avenues or new lanes of approach where we didn't have those lanes of approach before. The only things that, were, that was really up there were submarines. Um, and now we have surface ships that are up there also. So that's been the change that we see that's occurring now and it's going to keep occurring well into the future uh, To and the access will continue to grow. Where it gets better, and that's a relative term, is that when the center of that sea ice opens up, they will have that direct polar route where it won't be under the control of any specific country as far as engaging that area. So hope that answers the question that, that popped up. Thank you. Dr. Fogg, thank you very much. And in fact, I think you have covered the next question's answer as well, it had to do with the Arctic dimension of indo pacoms AOR and how it relates to climate risks. So I'm going to um, make the assumption that Dr. Fogg has addressed that, unless um, anyone wants to chime in on that. Sounds good? Okay, so we'll go to the next one. Um, Since the physics don't care who is in the White House or Congress, what was Indo-PACOM able to accomplish regarding climate security between 2017 and 2021? Sure, so that's a great question. And, and I guess the probably the greatest thing that they and, and many people in the in government in general, and I've heard this from multiple sources, that was able to accomplish is you just didn't call it climate change. <laughs> you called it something else. So for example, in talking to the Coast Guard, <clears throat> the Coast Guard literally was at conferences and they would get yelled at. The, you know, why aren't we doing stuff with climate change? And they go, well, you know, I, I'm here to talk about, you know, food insecurity and fish fish changes and sea level rise, which are all wrapped up into climate change. But the politics at the time said you couldn't say it. So the reality was is that the, the government writ large continued to work climate change issues well through the previous administration. They just oftentimes called it something else. Um, If you look and you can go across the government and look at that, if you look at the fuel efficiency changes across the Department of Defense and greenhouse gas reductions, you know, have been going on for the better part of 15 or 20 years within the DOD itself. If you look at the work that that Indo-PACOM and some of its subordinate commands have done with respect to, you know, the Corps of Engineers, for example, I asked them, what do you guys do with respect to, to climate change? They go, every single project that we do, every single project that we do has a climate impact to it. Right. Sometimes we call it that. Sometimes we just design to it. So a seawall design, for example, at a port facilities in some you know, small country or U.S. location is designed with with climate change in mind. Um, so the answer is it never stopped. It was largely just called something else uh, in the interests of of the political environment at the time. So which which really surprised me because at, I didn't start doing this until this past summer. I've cared about it for a long time. I didn't really start doing it in the past summer, and, and I was really pleasantly surprised to see that it didn't stop. So. Thank you. Next question. What sort of support or coordination with Department of Navy HQ would help Indo-PACOM implement and publicize their CCI program? So I guess the question to that, uh, I think I see the name is from Adam. I guess the question back to Adam would be, well, it depends, you know, where do you work? <laughs> is that is that your function up there? Because that'd be awesome to be able to relay because we are a naval, you know, theater. Uh, you know, most of us covered with water. We're led by a four-star naval commander and have been for probably the entire existence of the command. Um, you know, and the more that we can do with respect to resourcing, because that's where Indo-PACOM gets its resources is, okay, Department of the Navy, and what can you do to help resource not just fleet naval forces and their activities, but the command headquarters itself and the things that we want to do? And I'll give you an example. So if if you're um, the Air Force, for example, and, and you want to do a military construction project, and one of the places that you want to do work is in Timor-Leste. So there's an airfield in Timor-Leste called Bacau. 
right? Because it could be very important strategically to the United States. So let's spend some money to try and make it better. Well, that same headquarters Air Force is also fighting for money to improve the airfield at Charleston Air Force Base in South Carolina. Well, Charleston has lots of congressmen, lots of senators, and Timor Leste has none. Right. So how do you fight for the resources through the service components to get the service components and then advocate military construction projects at non DOD installations? That's it's wicked hard. Right. You know, and when you look at Indo PACOM, you know, we're talking in the in the billions and billions of dollars in construction projects that are on the books in order to support the commander sees the initiative effort in support of oak plants. Uh, I think some of those can be can be a uh, compounded upon with climate change dollars and sort of the climate change perspective, which is one of the things that we're looking at. So, you know, advocate the hell out of it for us would be my answer. And and I'll, I'll send you copies of the slides. I think it's already gone up to, I wish I could remember her name, the special assistant for uh, secure, for climate change in the, the chief of Naval operations office. But, you know, we're, we're a huge fan. I think we have time for one more question. Does the COE, whoops, I'm sorry. Okay, it just kind of flipped out from my vision here. Okay, does the COE work with the DKI APCSS or is DKI APCSS involved in the CIPCS or more broadly on these climate security matters? So the, the answer is absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, I was at APCSS uh, yesterday, actually teaching climate change to one of their programs. They're involved, uh, Dr. Ethan Allen, and prior to him, Dr. Scott Hogger are very involved in our process. And me and Admiral Gumatata are really good friends. Uh, I'm gonna throw one more question in just for the fun of it there, because there was a question asked, um, trying to remember it had to do with, with Oh, HADR mission increasing in complexity. So I think it was John Sales sort of has that one down there. Um, the answer is if as the DOD, as climate continues to change, right, and disaster risks go up and the frequency of responses continue, you know, will this ever become a dedicated mission for U.S. military forces? You know, I don't know. I know that as long as, you know, when, when, uh, you know, certain members of Congress are there to say, absolutely not. This will never fund for, fund resources for this. But I think that as it changes, can you think about, I'm a likely those famous for saying, we need to think, act, and operate differently, right? Well, we need to think, act, and operate about climate change differently because it is changing the landscape of the way that we prepare and respond. And, you know, it's just important that we adapt as the climate, you know, changes and, and try and accommodate the things that we can do. So I'll, I'll pause there as I saw Andrea pop back up, so. Mr. Joe Martin, thank you very much. And now back to Commander Cameron. I would like to thank Dr. Hyatt Alvey and Mr. Joe Martin for their presentation on Indo-PACOM and the Climate Change Impact Program, especially Joe who woke up early, not just to do his own presentation, but to watch most of the event today. This was a wonderful panel to conclude, especially your final question and answer about whether this will be an expanded mission set for the DOD. Today was an exceptional event that asked each geographic combatant command how they assessed their climate risks and what they were planning to do about them. I am honored to have the support of each region so that we could bring this event to you today. When I started conceptualizing the event, I came up with a standard formula of a J4, J5 team. However, as it came together, it was fascinating to see the different culture and personality of each geographic combatant command and how they approached today's presentations. I also enjoyed watching them work together for climate change does not respect the lines we draw on our maps. In addition, at the very beginning of the event, I offered a holistic view of what climate security might entail. I said at the time that some of the things on the list we do well some of the things we're starting to think about and some need more attention. But one thing I expected today was the amount of thought put into the presentations by all of the teams. But what I probably wasn't expecting was the candor for where we need to start putting more attention. I'd like to thank the teams for their preparation and their honesty throughout the entire event. 
Many of the presenters today are my friends and colleagues who helped shape the event, particularly those in the J4 offices around the world who have been carrying the mantle of climate environmental security issues for years. I truly appreciate how they helped make the format for today possible. And with all that being said, this is just a start. Last year, the president of the Naval War College called my first conference inaugural, which meant I could bring to you another event today. But with so much progress in one year, I'm already looking forward to what we might be able to pull together for next year. I would like to thank all the speakers and moderators for their participation today, as well as our special events team, PAO, media services, alumni programs, and our own climate librarian, Isabel Lops, and of course, Professor Michael Bush. While I was on camera, it took a large team to deliver this event today, and I couldn't have done it without them. As a reminder, all of these panels have been recorded and we'll be available on the Naval War College YouTube site next week. Thank you for joining us today. Stay safe, everyone. This concludes our virtual conference on the national security significance of a changing climate with the specific theme of operationalizing climate security. Thank you for joining us.